Hi, and welcome back to the Gluten Free RN podcast. I'm Nadine Griskowiak, and this is episode 28. Today, we are going to discuss the relationship between your lungs and celiac disease. That includes your entire respiratory system or your airway. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Nadine Griskoyak, the Gluten-Free RN. Today, during the Gluten-Free RN podcast, we're going to talk about your lungs, your entire respiratory system, or your airway, and the relationship to celiac disease. The interesting thing is, in the literature, it is considered to be a rare, atypical presentation or symptom or a causal effect of gluten on the respiratory tract. However, It is interesting that if you have a leaky gut because of ingestion of gluten, which is wheat, barley, rye, or oats, you also have a leaky blood-brain barrier. You also have leaky lung tissue, leaky skin, and leaky blood vessels. Sometimes that leads to edema, which is third spacing of fluid in your body. It's all epithelial tissue. Our body is really good at keeping different fluids separate unless our tissues get leaky. Right off the bat early on, 10 plus years ago, I was interested in the connection between celiac disease and the respiratory system. One, because I had respiratory symptoms and a chronic nasty cough that would not go away. I sounded like a barky dog, like a kid that had croup, a really deep bark cough that no matter what I did, it wouldn't go away. And sometimes it got worse. And one of my friends, also a nurse, had an interesting history of having one lung removed when she was a child. When I asked her, why did you have one lung removed? And honestly, she can't remember what the circumstances were. But about the same time that I was putting two and two together and going on a gluten-free diet, she also was struggling and opted to try a gluten-free diet. Now, she only had one lung, so she the assumption was is that she was always going to need inhalers. So she had a purse full of inhalers, all different strengths and medications. She had rescue inhalers and everyday inhalers that she routinely took so that she could breathe. Well, she ended up going on a gluten-free diet for a number of reasons, and come to find out, she no longer needed her, her inhalers. Her asthma was gone. Her inflammatory response in her lungs was cleared up. So she wrote a nice letter to her doctor and said, you know what? I don't really have asthma. I don't need my inhalers. Why didn't you test me years ago for celiac disease? So lo and behold, she no longer needs all of those inhalers. She doesn't have asthma and she's very much exercising without any respiratory difficulty and getting through her daily life activities without feeling like she can't breathe. So this connection between your airway or your respiratory system and your lungs is considered to be a rare presentation, but more and more so it is showing up in the literature as either case reports or an association that clears up on a gluten-free diet. There's a number of reasons for this, potentially. The number one reason would be the correction of anemia. So when people are anemic, their red blood cells are the ones that actually carry the oxygen. But if you don't have enough red blood cells to carry that oxygen, people will frequently feel short of breath, even with minimal exertion. These are the people that can't donate blood or might look extra pale and have a hard time breathing. Because again, those red blood cells just aren't there to transport that oxygen to the cells and to the tissues. Some people get recurrent respiratory tract infections like pneumonia or bronchitis or sinus infections. Perhaps the reason for the repeat or recurrent infections is because the intestines are damaged and thereby your immune system is damaged. 70 to 90 percent of your immune system is in your intestines. That's a lot. If your intestines are damaged and your immune system is damaged, your entire body is at risk for developing any infection, especially if you're exposed to things like viruses or bacteria or any type of 
infectious agent that could cause an infection. So pneumonias, bronchiectasis, bronchiolitis, all are potentially signs or symptoms that could be caused by the ingestion of gluten because it damages the small intestine and thereby damages the immune system. There's also an interesting link between cystic fibrosis and celiac disease. There are several studies that suggest that anybody with cystic fibrosis should be tested for celiac disease. I'll be interested to see what those further studies show. And interestingly enough, people that have COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, in the absence of smoking, some of these people actually get better on a gluten-free diet. Again, with that chronic cough, difficulty breathing, there's no downside to at least trying a a gluten-free diet or getting tested for celiac disease proper. Not everybody has the option of getting tested for celiac disease proper. One of the reasons is because doctors aren't very well versed in what some of the signs and symptoms are, especially the atypical signs or symptoms that people might present with that would suggest body inflammation in general or damage to the intestines. Also, keeping in mind that celiac disease is primarily a neurological disorder. There's an interesting disorder called idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis, and it's IPH, also referred to as IPH. It's actually a bleeding lung. What are some of the circumstances in which people could develop a bleeding lung? Well, if people are vitamin K deficient, which is a fat soluble vitamin, it can cause easy bruising, nosebleeds, and perhaps a bleeding lung. So another good reason to actually look into celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity as a possibility, because that vitamin K is for clotting. It helps with blood to actually clot. And if there's not enough vitamin K or people are vitamin K deficient, they're more at risk for bleeding disorders. And I certainly would consider a bleeding lung to be a bleeding disorder. And in this case, it's referred to as IPH, or idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis, which, by the way, idiopathic means they don't know what causes it. And of course, at this point in history, anytime I see that term idiopathic, which means we as medical professionals do not know what causes it, celiac disease should be on the differential diagnosis. It should be one of those things that we look at, test for, and if possible, either rule it in. And as I've said before, at this point in history, people cannot be ruled out for celiac disease because it can develop at any age, with any symptom, at any time, in any ethnicity, and with any symptom or no symptoms. So we have to keep celiac disease on the differential diagnosis at all times. Celiac disease must be considered with any etiology of chronic respiratory signs or symptoms since a gluten-free diet or a paleo whole food diet can produce a dramatic response to children's and adults' overall health, thereby increasing their quality of life. And what that means is unless we're addressing these issues and looking at them and recognizing a correlation between what people are eating and inflammation, in this case in the lungs, that if we remove that gluten or the irritant or the cause of that inflammation, then perhaps people will get better and they'll be able to operate as human beings on a higher level. Whether that means they'll be able to go outside and play, they won't be as susceptible to allergens in the environment, such as pollen or food intolerances. Once we heal the intestines, once we fix that leaky gut by going on at least a gluten-free, dairy-free diet, and hopefully some variation of a paleo diet or a whole food diet, people's intestines will heal, their immune system will settle down, and be able to actually recognize things that are antigens or invaders. So ideally, we're going to give people the opportunity to heal their intestines, heal their immune system, get that inflammation out of their body, whether it's in their lung or their intestine 
or their brain or wherever that inflammation sits. Sometimes it's in the joints, in the muscles. So anything that ends in itis, pharyngitis, glossitis, bronchitis, arthritis, that itis means inflammation. All diseases start in the gut. So it's very important that we look at the intestines, not that that we can actually see them, but we have to look at the intestines as the beginning of any inflammation in the body. And what can we do to get rid of that inflammation? So because we all have to breathe, it's very good if we can all breathe very effectively and we don't have to pay attention to it. It should be one of those things that our body just naturally does. But if you become very aware of difficulty breathing or chest tightness or chronically having to clear your throat or a nagging cough, sometimes that keeps you up at night so that you have sleep disturbances because it's difficult to breathe. And if you have a leaky gut, there's a good chance you have this leaky lung. Some people end up with pulmonary edema or fluid in their lungs. That's not a very good idea. As a nurse, I feel it's very important that people understand that there's even a causal effect from eating gluten on your lungs is a good enough reason to get tested for celiac disease and, if nothing else, try a gluten-free diet. And when I say try a gluten-free diet, again, I mean hopefully a gluten-free and dairy-free diet at the very least, if not some variation of a paleo diet or a whole food diet. See if your symptoms go away or improve. Now, don't just try this for a week or five days. It takes at least six months to a year for your intestinal villi to grow back, for that inflammation to dissipate, and for your immune system to heal. So it's very important that people realize that this is not an overnight thing that you have to be determined to stay gluten zero, as my friend Dr. Rodney Ford would say, or 100% gluten-free at the very least. Please focus on whole foods, which are meat, fish, and eggs, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds. The more you can incorporate those very basic food items into your diet, the faster your body will heal because your body knows what to do with those foods. It knows how to break them down, and the nutrients that are available in those foods are bioavailable to your body, which means your body knows what to do with them and how to utilize the nutrients in those foods. Another thing I talk a lot about is being on a super good high fat diet. People with celiac disease or non celiac gluten sensitivity often have a hard time, number one, breaking down fat so that their body can utilize it and also absorbing it. So people that are especially newly diagnosed celiac must be on a super good high fat diet. And that super good high fat diet is going to help your body number one, heal, and number two, be able to absorb the fat soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K. Those fat soluble vitamins are going to help your body heal and repair itself much quicker. And we did talk about vitamin K being for blood clotting primarily, and most people do not get a vitamin K level when they go in to see their doctor. But a good indicator if your vitamin K level would be low would be a vitamin D level. So if your vitamin D level is low and anything below 40, I would consider to be critically low. So I like to see a vitamin D level between 60 and 100 because that's where the oncologists like to see it, because it's cancer preventative. Why people don't know this, I don't know, but I'm going to tell you. So if your vitamin D level is a single digit, which I've seen before, or in the teens or 20s, or even in the 30s, then you can pretty much assume all of your other fat-soluble vitamins are low also. Again, fat-soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K, very important for repairing your connective tissue, rebuilding, healing your body. So your body can use these fat-soluble vitamins to heal and repair itself in connective tissue and healing up that leaky gut, which is very much the most important thing ever. So do a little research yourself. Look into celiac disease and respiratory issues. There's a lot of anecdotal information out there. People will tell you that their respiratory symptoms go away once they go on a gluten-free diet. And nobody had made that connection. 
that their respiratory symptoms were connected to eating gluten. But there's so much anecdotal evidence at this point, those studies just need to be done so that that direct correlation can be made. So if you're in a position to do a research study on the respiratory system and the ingestion of gluten, please do so. If you need my help, I'm happy to help you put that study together so that we can actually get some information that is published that connects the respiratory system with celiac disease proper. Again, you should never be aware of the fact that you have to take a breath. And normal breathing is between 14 and 20 breaths a minute. But if you're aware of all of those breaths that you're taking, something is wrong. Something in your respiratory system is awry. If your chest feels tight or you have a chronic cough or you're constantly clearing your throat or you can't breathe because your sinuses are clogged and you also have post-nasal drip all the time, which means that your, your sinuses are constantly draining because they're inflamed. So a rhinitis. So it's very important that we actually start to pay attention to our bodies in all parts of it. We're all connected. Every part of our body is connected and influenced by primarily what we eat. So it would be ridiculous to think that our lungs are a very separate part of our body that are not influenced by the ingestion of gluten. Look around your family members, your friends, your neighborhood, at your coworkers. If anybody has a difficult time breathing or is constantly having to use an inhaler, or has that naggy cough and difficulty clearing their throat, suggest that they get tested for celiac disease proper. And then in the absence of positive celiac tests, consider they try a gluten-free diet in the hopes that some of those respiratory problems will go away. But always do get a baseline for a celiac panel, the celiac antibody panel, hopefully see if these people are carrying the HLA, DQ2, and or DQ8 genes which predispose people for celiac disease proper. So once again, thank you for listening. I'm Nadine Griskoyak, RN, BSN, CEN, and this has been episode 28 on the lungs, respiratory system, your airway, and celiac disease. Thank you to Tim Hallowell of The Podcasting Guy for being such a great executive producer of the Gluten-Free RN podcast. And a huge shout out to Pulse Media Network, a group of healthcare providers that are also podcasters. Pulse Media Network is extremely supportive of the Gluten-Free RN podcast, and I'd like to thank them for all of their support. Now it's time to thank you for listening and ask you to go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to the Gluten-Free RN podcast and rate it. And if you're so inclined, please put a comment. I love to read them, and I'm thanking all of the people that have left comments already. They're extremely helpful for me to know which content is useful for you to hear and where to go for future episodes. I'm Nadine Griskoyak. This has been a great episode 28 of connecting the lungs, respiratory system, your airway with celiac disease. So we're connecting our guts and our lungs today. And I hope you learned something new. And maybe due to this lovely podcast, somebody in your life or you yourself will recognize that your lungs are connected to your intestines and the health of your lungs are connected to your intestines. Again, I'm Nadine Gruskoyak, the Gluten-Free RN, and this is the Gluten-Free RN podcast. Until next time, happy breathing. Happy breathing.